In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one essence with the Father, through whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became human and was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried and rose on the third day according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who spoke through the prophets, in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, <coughs> I acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I expect the resurrection of the dead and life of the age to come. Amen. Take a seat. <coughs> I pray and I hope that you're all well after this uh, short break that we had. Um, tonight, I found a few months ago, I found something really interesting on YouTube um, from Elder Zachariah Zacharu, um, who is a monk from the monastery of St. John the Forerunner in Essex. And he's also. Um, a disciple of um, of Saint Sophroni of Essex. So Saint Sophroni of Essex was his spiritual father. He was a disciple of him, and and obviously him being the abbot of the monastery, Elder Zachariah was um, under him, under his his guidance, and obviously spiritual father. Uh, and so he was a he was a monk um, that lived. Uh, and breathed the, the theology of one of the our, our most modern, not only saints, Saint Sophroni, but fathers of the church. I don't know if any of you are familiar uh, with the writings and the teachings of Elder so um, Saint Sophroni of Essex, um, but he's renowned, I guess, for his orthodox teachings, um, and that he's one of the fathers of the church, considered as one of now the fa fathers of the church. And funny enough, his spiritual father was Saint Siluan the Athenite. If any of you have read the life of Saint Siluan the Athenite, it's this big, thick um, blue book. It was written by Saint Sophroni of Essex. Um, and then the disciple of Saint Sophroni of Essex was Father Zacharia Zacharu, who, in which I must boast, is by birth and descent a Cypriot. So <laughs> he's from Cyprus, um, uh, and he's still, thank God, alive and well, and still um, giving uh, talks and passing on um, the spirituality uh, of these contemporary saints of the church. And so I came across this, um, it was about a 30-minute interview um, with um, Elder Zachariah, and every single word of it was just mind-blowing. Um, and I didn't know what to do. Um, so I just sat there and wrote every single word out. And you think, um, and so, because I thought, I better, be t I better take some notes um, with this. So I sat down and it started off with notes, like, okay, but that was good, and that was good. So that I'm just going to start from the start and write it all out. So I sat there and I wrote it all out because I really wanted to share it with you. And then you're going to say to me, why can't we just listen to it ourselves? <laughs> and I want you, since it's on YouTube, I guess that's probably the smarter and better option. But I thought sometimes when we, when we share it together, then we can also discuss it together as well um, and share our thoughts on it um, and our questions and sort of maybe dissect it a little bit more. So I'll start it today and we'll see as, as far as it goes. If we might be able to finish it today, we might finish it next week. We'll see. 
but it's called um, it, the title of it, and you can find it on um, uh, YouTube, is um, The Inner Man. Uh, that's the title of it by Elder Zacharia Zacharu. Don't just write The Inner Man because you'll come up, I just as I saw today this morning, with a whole list of different, all these rock songs and all that, whatever. Uh, so you've got to be specific. The Inner Man by Father Zacharia Zacharu. Okay. And it, um, yeah, it's called The Inner Man. The first part of it is, um, and it's pretty much, he's pretty much speaking about um, how we discover ourselves, how we discover our inner self, um, and discover our heart. And it begins, um, uh, it's, it's a Romanian person who's asking him questions, and he's basically saying the responses. So he starts off with a question, the man who's interviewing him says, nowadays, there's a great, a great emphasis is placed on things which can be seen, those which are material. Is it still possible to enter within ourselves? And he says, we cannot enter our heart without the grace of God. In the beginning, uh, mind and heart were one. You see, um, and we often hear this and we emphasise that the, the mind is... Um, most of most people, or if you ask someone, I guess, um, with a, a secular mindset, where's your mind? The point here, okay. But for an orthodox, our mind is here. Our mind should be in our heart. That's where our mind is. So up here is our intellect, everything which is logical. It's our intellect, but our mind, as always, in the way we understand it, is something which is in our heart. It's where we experience God, and that's why we call that our mind. The inner eye was blurred through sin. So he speaks about the senses. Okay, like, Just like we have physical senses, we also have the spiritual senses. And so the result of sinning was to, um, to tarnish our inner, the inner senses, our spiritual senses. So the inner eye was blurred through sin. The heart then just became a place which pumped blood and not a place to meet God and where God is reigning. Rediscover our heart, we can rediscover our heart, he's saying, through repentance. And this is a word that you probably even hear me saying constantly, that repentance is the centre of our spiritual life. It's the, it's the centre of spirituality. It's the only path that we can take so that we can meet Christ and come in unity with Christ. Repentance. And I guess it's, 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 such a, it's, it's a fundamental word. And even St. Basil the Great, when he's instructing priests um, on how to, when, they, when they're giving a sermon, when they're speaking to the people, he even says that we should never, ever give a sermon without emphasizing repentance in it so that every time a priest speaks somehow what he says should lead the person or the people that he's speaking to to repentance he says so to rediscover someone's heart they do it through repentance through repentance we acquire grace and grace heals man and unifies his being and mind and heart and they are able to fulfill in a godly manner the commandments which demand that we should love God with all our heart and accommodate in our heart all humankind. Okay, so that's what repentance does. That's the power of uh, repentance. It accommodates God in our heart, you know, and all humankind. And so then he asks um, <coughs> the second question. How do we find our inner person? How do we find our interiority? And he says, we can find our inner man through repentance. Repentance, he says, comes in many ways. First, accepting the word of God by believing the word, by praying with the word of God, we accumulate in our heart the traces of his grace. And when they come to a certain fullness, the heart opens up 
to receive his grace and to receive him entirely. The second way, or another way, of accumulating in our heart the traces of his presence, um, the, the traces of his presence in our heart, is through the invocation of his name. The name of Christ is inseparable from his person. So we know what that means, the invocation of the name of Christ. You're all familiar with it. That, that short prayer that we constantly say and we're asked to say, but effective prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me as a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. So that prayer, which is the invocation of the name of Christ, he says, the name of Christ is inseparable to his person, who Christ is. That's how powerful the name of Christ is. And that's why so many things are performed in the name of Christ. And it even says in the scriptures that, um, that at the name of Christ, all knees shall, shall bend before the name of Christ. And he says, when we invoke or call upon his name, we vivify, we quicken his presence in our heart, and the presence of the Lord is saving. Um, in the th epistle of the Thessalonians, when the Lord comes again, the spirit of his presence will consume the spirit of wickedness or the Antichrist. By calling upon his name, we file the rust which we accumulate through sin, through the corruption of this world. That's how powerful for us the name of Christ is. One way of discovering our heart is to bear shame before God in our confession. Okay, and we'll speak a little bit about that as well. We are united to the church through the sacraments through, and through the sacraments of repentance and confession. In confession, we suffer a certain shame that humbles our heart. And this humility attracts grace and the inner man begins to emerge. The greater the shame that is to say the more sincere and deep is our confession, the more grace will acquire and will be united and join fitly to the body of Christ, the church. This is a very powerful means, especially these days, where we are not so good in ascetic life. This shame which we bear in confession can make up to a certain extent for the asceticism which is lacking from us. And so these days, basically what he's saying is, these days, it's not like back then when people were, let's say, they had more self-control with their mind, with their bodies, with their thoughts, with their actions. People were, had more self-control. People were able also to practice asceticism to a greater extent. What's asceticism? It's that spiritual struggle that we do not only within, our, within ourselves, but with our bodies as well. You see a lot of the times, not just monks and nuns, but also lay people knew how to pray. They knew how to um, you know, stand in worship. They knew how to fast, you know, and without having the substitutes, you know, that we have today. You see, today, everything is easy. Today, we have our comfortable life, lifestyle. Today, we have the luxuries that we do, our beds, the water, the foods, you know, um, our rest, even the way that we, we use with, with technology and all that. So all of these things... Um, it direct, um, distract us, let's say, from maybe the ascetical life, the askis is what we will call in our life. And that, that's not so much you know, possible. And so we see that um, it's easier to fall into sin. Uh, we're bombarded by sin. Um, and we don't have, let's say, that self-control that previous generations and the fathers of, the, of, of previous times had. But he's saying that it doesn't matter. We might not have that, but we all. But we have the sacrament of confession, and the sacrament of confession is that piece of the jigsaw puzzle that a lot of the times is missing in our spiritual life. That once we place it there, it reconnects everything together. It puts everything together. It reunites us 
with the body of Christ, which he calls the church. And I think that this is something that we need to remember, that the church and Christ is not something which is separate. Okay? The church and Christ is one and the same thing. And one of the big deceptions that I see today is that people think that we can find Christ or we can have Christ without the church. And even vice versa, that we can use the church and have Christ absent from that. And that's very, and that's, that's something that, um, believe it or not, uh, you're probably questioning, you know, how is that even possible? How can, you, how can you want to use the church but have Christ absent from that? Easy, you know. We want to get married in the church, for example, um, only because it's tradition, and we want to baptise our children in the church only because it's a ritual and, and it's the thing to do, okay, and an, an excuse for an extra party. We need to do the funeral in the church, you know, because we were baptised as Greek Orthodox, but not that we believe in the power of the sacrament. Not that we really believe that when we're baptising someone or when I'm baptising my child, then I'm uniting him to the body of, the, of Christ. Not that I believe that in the, in the sacrament of marriage, when two people come and they're blessed in that sacrament, they become one, okay, and they're united through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Not that I believe that when, when I'm performing a funeral in the church, that I'm there not to celebrate the life of the person who died, which we hear so often these days. How many times now I hear in funeral eulogies, we are here to celebrate the life of so-and-so. And we are here to remember how our Papu Yani was the best Papu in the world. He had the best garden, you know, and um, now he's up there with Papu Manoli and they're playing Davli in heaven, you know. These are the, this is our understanding of what the, the, the church is. And then, you know, we're obliged to read these sort of things. You know, we don't celebrate the life of the person at the funeral. We're praying for them at the funeral. It's their last. We're praying and with our prayers, we're escorting them to their final resting place. You know, and we're praying that, you know, that for the mercy of God upon the soul of this person, you know, who's passed away, who's died. And that, you know, that they make it, you know, there to where we hope that they, we want them to go. Okay, so yes, it's very possible, you know, for us to want the church without Christ and it's very possible for people to believe that they can attain or know Christ without the church. And that's a very, and that's another, that extreme is something which is very Protestant. It's what the Protestants do. Um, you know, that we don't need the sacraments anymore. They, they threw out the sacraments. You know, we don't need, you don't need to go to church, you know, to believe in God. You don't need to have all of that. All of that is ritualistic. They're, they're, they're rituals. They're the things. And you see, this is how they, they, they deceive the minds of the people. And I've heard it so many times because it's been said to me as well by them. You know, these things are Pharisaic. It's what the Pharisees used to do in the scriptures. Okay, so they see the church as something ritualistic and Pharisaic. You know? um, uh, and, and we know that that's, that's, that that's not the case. You know, that through St. Paul, and St. Paul says in the scriptures, you know, that we as, uh, are the, we as the church make up the body of Christ. You know? And do you not know, and we say it even in the, <coughs> in the marriage we say it in the marriage sacrament, we read from the Ephesians. And when we're talking to the husband and the wife, St. Paul is talking to the husband and the wife, and he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. That the, that the husband, wives know that the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. Okay? So there whether people like it or not, whether they want to accept it or not, you know, the Christ and the church come united, are one and the same thing. And the reason why I'm saying this is, you know, because I, I've, I've recently, uh, I don't know, but um, I've seen this type of Protestantism um, creeping into the Orthodox Church as well. You know, even amongst us as Orthodox, 
We've rejected everything. We've rejected, you know, the sacrament of priesthood, hierarchy. You know, we've overthrown all that. You know, we've disregarded all these things. You know, thinking that, you know, if we do some things, you know, that we're used to as Orthodox as well, it's enough to, to safeguard us, you know. And I can do my thing as an Orthodox, but do it separated pretty much from the body of the, of the sacraments. You know, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Um, and Elder Zacharias is saying here um, that it's through the sacraments, and especially the sacrament of confession, that we reunite with Christ. And he's talking about that shame. The shame that we bear when we need to go to confession. And we feel, we feel like that. We feel that a lot of the times. You know what? And that's not, that's not necessarily such a bad thing. A lot of people say, I don't want to go to confession because I'm ashamed. Or they might not even say it. You know, they might use a million other excuses. But deep down, probably what they're trying to say, what we mean, okay, and I think because we've all felt it, is that, you know, I'm, I'm avoiding going to confession because I'm, I'm ashamed. But then we should think, then, then I sh that, that's when we really should think, then I should be going to confession because I feel ashamed. Okay. And it's okay to feel that. Why? Because, like he's saying here, when we bear that shame and we take it to the sacrament and we present it before the priest okay, to another person, okay, then what, what are we doing? We are humbling ourselves. And like I've said before, there's a difference between humbling and humiliating. The church does not want to humiliate us. Christ does not want to humiliate us, but he does want us humble. And the way to become humble, a lot of the times, is through these means. And this is why a lot of the times, to answer people's questions, why can't I just confess to God? You know, why can't I just pray to my icons? Because when we do that, and I think that all of you can un probably understand this, you know, we're not really feeling that, that shame. You know, it's pretty easy to do that. But it's difficult to actually humble yourself and go and expose yourself to someone else, to another person. It's very humbling. And that's why I believe that Christ um, actually used and gave us this method of confession to teach us humility. Um, and it's probably the safest, the safest way to humble ourselves. We would rather be humbled before a priest in the sacrament of confession rather than having the rest of the world humble and also humiliate us when they know our sins and our passions. Yeah. Another powerful way, he says, another powerful way of accumulating grace in our hearts and cleansing the inner eye of our soul, while, um, which was given to us at baptism, is through a worthy participant, um, a worthy... I'm getting old. <laughs> is through a worthy par um, participation of the sacraments of the church and especially the Holy Eucharist. Because there we come to the Holy Eucharist, offering all our life to God, all our faith, all our humility, all our repentance, all our good dispositions of our soul, all the expectations we have of Him for our salvation. We invest them in the gifts within the pre uh, which the priest is offering on our behalf. We put all our life in those gifts and the priest says to God thine own from thine own we offer unto thee in all and for all and God accepts this offering and he does the same he puts those gifts his life the divine life the grace of the Holy Spirit he makes them his body and his blood in which all his divinity dwells and he returns them to us saying through the mouth of the priest, the holy things unto the holy. And there is an exchange, a powerful, um, un unequal um, thought, 
an exchange of lives. We offer our limited and small life to God and he offers back to us his unlimited and eternal life in the holy gifts. Okay. This is what's happening in the divine liturgy. So in the divine liturgy, when the priest says, when the priest offers the gifts, and what are the gifts? The gifts is bread and it's wine and he's offering them to God. And when he's offering to them to God, all he's saying is your own from your own. I'm giving you whatever is already yours. Okay? That's what we mean when we say your own from your own. We offer you in every way and for everything. I'm giving you from whatever is already yours. And then during that invocation, when we're offering God um, all of this, we're, what are we saying to him? We're praying to him not only to sanctify the gifts that are being presented, but we say, send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts which are presented. So first, even before the gifts are consecrated and become the body and blood of Christ, we're asking Christ okay, to send his Holy Spirit on us. And why are we asking Christ to consecrate us before he consecrates the gifts? So that we can become worthy participants of the gifts. And what does it mean when we say worthy participants of the gifts? If every time, if every time that we receive the gifts, we say and when we pray the, the prayers of, of the Holy Eucharist, um, to how can I approach who I am unworthy? I am the worst of, and, and the first, the chief amongst sinners, the first amongst sinners, and we call ourselves among, how can we ask now the Holy Spirit to come and make us worthy of them? When we say to make us worthy of them, it means for those gifts, when we receive them, for them to become active within us, for them to change our lives, to change it, to cleanse our senses, to sanctify us, to make us holy. And what does it mean to be holy? Holy, what are we saying? And when he says that part, that second part when, okay, after we've offered the gifts, then the priest says, now talking to God, he's saying your own from your own. Um, and then, then we say, um, let us attend the holy gifts for the holy ones or for the holy people of God. So he's saying, let us attend, he's saying to the people, in other words, now pay attention, pay attention, this is just before the doors close. Pay attention now, be attentive, the holy gifts for the holy ones. And now the holy ones, who are they? There's us, me and you. So we are, we are receiving holiness. And then the chanters then say, as soon as we say that, then the chanters then remind us and they say, Isaios, Iskirios, Isus Christos. One is holy, one is Lord, Jesus Christ. So after the priest has called us holy, the chanters respond and say, but only one is holy. Which what, Then what does that mean? Then that means we become one with the one who is holy. And when we become one with the one who is holy, then we become holy as well. We become sanctified. And this is the very purpose, the essence of the Christian life. The Christian life is to become holy by being united with the one, the only one, who is holy. Holiness cannot be achieved in any other way. In any other way it can't be achieved. And this is why now for 2,000 years there has never been recognised a saint which has not been part of the church. There's never. What does saint mean? What does saint mean? Sir? So, what else? But what does that, that mean? It's the same word. Holy. Holy. Saint means holy. Saint, holy, ayos is the same word, just in different languages. Ayos is Greek, 
Holy is English, Saint is Latin, Sanctus. Okay, so it's the same word, just in different languages, right? And so there has never been in the history of the church someone who has re reached holiness outside the church. Now, that doesn't mean that someone outside the church cannot be saved. To be saved does not mean that you are sanctified. There's, there's a difference there. There's a difference. Sesos menos, okay, is to be saved in Greek. And there are people who have been saved. And that can be someone, you know, amongst us, God willing, you know, that we'd be saved. But our... Um, and, and that can be someone who's even a non-Christian. Even non-Christians can be saved. Like St. Um, Paul says in the letter to the Romans, there are those who know the law, okay, and then there are those who don't know the law but live the letter of the law in their heart. Okay? Those people can be saved, but they cannot be sanctified because they have not been united with Christ. They have not been united to holiness. And therefore, that's why we've never experienced holiness or holiness has never been experienced outside the church. It's never happened. Um, what else? Through the worthy participation of the Holy, grief, um, the Holy Gifts, we receive the grace of the Holy Spirit which enlightens our inner being, our inner heart. That is why the church, after Holy Communion, sings the triumphant hymn, We have seen the true light. The church, through all the sacraments, offers this possibility to build the temple of God in their hearts, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Then God is pleased not to dwell in temples made by hands of man, though his presence there is full, but even pleased to dwell in the temple of man's heart. So, more importantly, you know, yes, we have church buildings, okay. And what is this building called? Bravo. It's a temple, okay. If you see, like in Greek... You see what, what's written outside? Ieros naos. Naos means temple. It doesn't say ecclesia aias paraskevis. Ieros naos aias paraskevis. The holy temple of Saint Paraskevi. So these are temples. These are called temples. Okay. But he's saying here that yes, God dwells in these temples. And he, the only reason why he dwells in here is because the divine liturgies is being served here. But now, because we become a participant of that, then he becomes now, he dwells in our hearts. And going back to two places, coming to mind two places of the Holy Scriptures, that um, first, Christ, when Christ says um, that the kingdom of heaven is within you, okay, so that the kingdom of heaven basically is in us. It's in us. And when we say in the Divine Liturgy, we begin with, Blessed is the kingdom of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So at that moment we're entering into the kingdom. Heaven and earth become one. And the other script, part of the scripture is the, the, the dialogue with the Samaritan woman. Where the Samaritan woman says, where should we worship God? Because the Jews worship him in the temple. And us Samaritans, we worship him here on this mountain. Where's the proper place to worship God? And Jesus says... There will come a time where you will worship him in spirit and in truth. So neither there or here, but in spirit and in truth. And the spirit is something that dwells within us. The power of tears. When our holy fathers, and in general, our tradition speaks of tears, they don't speak of psychological tears. Psychological tears make man with them. That is to say, deteriorate, and they don't help. But the tears that come from repentance are healing. 
because when we pray before God with tears, that means that we have only one thing or one thought, the thought of God. If we have two, th two thoughts, we cannot cry before God. We can only cry if we have one thought, the thought of God, and because this thought unifies our being, it is healing to us and unifies our mind with the heart and turns our whole being towards God. So the tears of repentance are healing and they are very much appreciated by the saints of our church. They are not like psychological tears. Psychologists are right when they say tears are not good, but they are not good when God is not at stake. But when we speak to God, we have not a better language to speak to him than the language of tears. It is the most noble language of man to speak to God. Um, uh, and tears, obviously, in our spirituality, is something which is, is emphasised a lot. And when you read the lives of the saints, especially the ascetic fathers, you see that this father had the gift of tears. You know, Father um, Saint Ephraim the Syrian was called the son of tears. You know, to pevitum vacrium, if I remember correctly. The son of tears. Why? Because um, constantly he had just the gift of tears coming, which means what? They're the... They're not the, the pain. <coughs> they're not the painful tears, as he says here. The psychological tears that are caused, you know, sometimes by our frustration, you know, by our pain, um, by our ego, you know, those type of tears. And when you when when you cry like that, you know, you have this heaviness inside you. These tears, and for those who have experienced it, is something which is totally different. They're the way that the sense, the sense of them is, is totally different. It's something which is sweet. It's something which is joyful. And if you look at, um, if you, you're familiar with Elder Joseph of Vatopevi, who, who passed away, um, he's the elder that passed away with a smile on his face. If you've seen photos of that, that's been going around, that's going around on the internet, you know, it's called the smile of eternity. You know, he smiled. And one of his disciples um, rightly said, you know, his whole life he spent crying. And so when he finally finished his life, God allowed him to rejoice and to smile at his death. You know? And it's true. If you see videos of Elder Joseph speaking or praying, videos of him on YouTube, constantly you just see his eyes full of just tears flowing. And once one of his... Um, disciples, which, which is Metropoli uh, Metropolitan Athanasius of Lim Limassol, those of you who are familiar with him, said he was, for, for a number of years, amongst the Brotherhood, he was the, only, um, he was the only priest. So he would liturgize for them four times a week at the monastery. He would do the, the liturgy four times a week. And four times a week, um, Elder Joseph would come to receive Holy Communion. And he said every time, he goes, and I'm not being, um, uh, what do you call it? I'm not, over time. I'm not being dramatic, I'm not, you know, whatever. Um, every time this man would come to receive Holy Communion, he would be wailing in tears and there would be two monks holding him on either side and holding him and sometimes we'd have to wait for a few minutes just so that he, can, he could compose himself so that he could receive Holy Communion. And I used to say to myself, I used to have, he goes, the, the, the thoughts, the temptation, and think to myself, can this man not once, at, just at least once, come and receive Holy Communion like the rest of us? You know, just normally come and receive Holy Communion every single time. And that's four times a week. Okay, it's not once a week, once a month or whatever. Every single time just to come and have to compose himself because he couldn't stop crying, okay? He couldn't stop. And, and if you listen to, to him, the relationship that he had with Christ, the way that he speaks about Christ, you can see and you, you, you can understand that this man was, was madly in love with Christ, in love with him, the way he speaks about, the way he speaks about him. 
And I pray that you know that you know, more of those the saints, these types of saints, you know, can can show us the way the, these days, you know, and what it means to truly love Christ and and live a Christ-centered life. Um, that was Elder Joseph of um, Vatopedi, and so um, yes, tears is something, but which is given to us by grace, and and given to us in repentance. And when we don't have tears, then we use the means that the church gives us to acquire at least tears of repentance. Now, tears of repentance is different to the tears of grace. Tears of repentance is, is feeling that remorse for your sins and offering then those, sin, that, those tears to God. Okay, We spoke about confession before, but not so much about repentance. Repentance comes before confession. Okay. We repent for our sins, and because we repent for them, we go and we confess them. And that's what we do before our icons and in prayer. You know, we kneel down. You know, we read prayers, whatever we can, and we ask God to forgive our sins. And then, you know, if we're really remorseful, then we'll have those tears of repentance. And then from those tears of repentance, when forgiveness comes, those bitter tears of repentance becomes the sweet tears of grace. Okay, And then he says, there is one criteria with tears. When the tears are healthy, they promote our converse with God. We want to speak more with God. And they bring strength to the heart to stand in the presence of God. The other kinds of tears disperse the mind and they make the person unable to stand in the presence of God. So when tears are promoting the prayer of repentance... They are very healthy, very beneficial, and they are very much appreciated. That's why God says, a humble spirit and a contrite heart God will not despise. Why are the tears so much appreciated and contrition? Because the nature of our God is to be a father of mercy and God of consolation. But for whom? For those who are whole, who are well for those who are whole, he's asking a question now. Who is, the, who is this God of consolation and, and, and of mercy? Now he's asking the question, is it for those who are whole? Is it for those who are well? They don't need a physician, he says. He has come for those who need healing, who turn to him as in need of healing. Therefore, because it is in his nature to be a comforter, comforter the Father, Comforter the Son, Comforter the Holy Spirit, and we can only re relate to Him if we come to Him with a contrite heart and with tears of repentance, because He says, I am not well pleased with a sacrifice. I want to give my mercy to those who have a humble heart. Okay. Hold on. I'll finish, I'll stop there. Um, there is still more, but we'll continue next week. Um, and I'll stop there in case there's something that you wanted to ask or say. Yes, Mary. Boris Nasiko, can you stand up? And yet, the, apart from going blind, I'm also going deaf. Definitely. He's kneeling, kneeling, in kneeling in prayer is a type of asceticism. So there's a few things that the fathers of the church um, say that help us while we're praying. One of them is kneeling. Um, Elder Porfirio speaks about um, the, the sweetness of kneeling during prayer. Um, and other fathers speak about kneeling. But uh, for, for, for some others, it could be standing. He could be standing in prayer. And, an, and another thing, and a very old um, practice, and a very old uh, practice, is not only either to kneel or to stand, but to have your arms stretched out in prayer. And to pray at times, it, can't, it doesn't have to be all the time, but at times when we're praying to God, to have our arms stretched out to Him. And if you notice, and you can't see it here, but traditionally in the church, um, 
where the apsis there is covered here by the iconostasis is, if you notice in, in, in traditional churches, is always the Panagia standing there with her arms stretched out. And that doesn't mean that the, that the Panagia, a lot of people take that as the Panagia protecting us. No, it's the Panagia in the, in the stance of prayer, supplicating. She has her arms stretched out. And that's how the early Christians would pray. If you, if you look, and I noticed this especially um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Middle East, I saw, when you say the Our Father, you stretch out your hands at the time of the Our Father. I noticed that. The priests, there's times in the liturgy where the priest will pray with his arms stretched out, like while the chanters are praying, saying the Aios or Theos, chanting the Aios or Theos. That prayer is required for the priest to say the prayer that which is said mystically inside with his arms stretched out. Or when he, he says the three times and does three bows, um, we who mystically represent the cherubim during the cherubim, again, he stretches out his hands and he says those prayers. Um, yeah, so that's a type of prayer, asceticism as well. Yeah. Kneeling. Hmm? Um, for everyone, it's something different. It could be something different. For some, it could be kneeling. For some, it could be standing. For some, it could be staying up at night and just doing vigil at night. For others, it could be getting up in the morning. For others, it could be fasting, a type of fasting that they, they do. Um, others have a blessing from their spiritual father to fast outside, extra fast, outside the, the, the given periods that the church gives us to fast. And uh, usually it could be a ganona that the, our spiritual father will give to us a prayer rule that we could say. Uh, our spiritual father will give us a, a certain prayer rule. Prostrations. Prostrations. We've forgotten how to do prostrations. The full one. You've got the small ones that we like sort of do together. You know where you just with one hand touch the ground. But then you've got the full ones where you actually your whole body falls to the ground. You know, on your knees and, and your head touches the ground. Because, because our entire being worships God. Both, not just our spirit. We don't just worship God with our spirit. We worship Him with our body as well. Remember, our body is just as, as sacred and holy as what our, what our soul is. And that's why we'll have, we believe in the resurrection of the dead. That's why we have holy relics. Because our, our, our body is also sanctified and, and acquires grace. And because it's our body that also makes us sin a lot of the times, we also do ascetic struggles with our body, using our body. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, the full prostrations can be done. The full prostrations can be done throughout the year not just during Lent, not just during Great Lent, um, except, except for um, 40 days after Pascha. So during Pascha we don't do prostrations. Yeah, we're standing, and that's why we don't, that's why we don't kneel yet during the Divine Liturgy. The canon specifically not only say the 40 days of Pascha, but also on Sundays as well, because it's the Day of Resurrection. Yeah. But every other time during the year, you can do prostrations. Yes. What am? Um, ne, and actually, it's not. It's not where they're going to be. It's what they can see. Okay. If that if that answers your question. So, um, and I'll and I'll explain to you what I mean by that. When we before when we spoke about being sanctified and being saved, and there's a difference between the two. Okay, um, being saved means that you can enjoy the presence of God 
um, and, and you do, you enjoy the presence of God um, in a way where your soul rejoices. But because your spiritual eyes are not cleansed, you cannot see the presence of God. So there's still something missing. It's not in its fullness. And that's, the sa it's, that's for those who are saved. Okay? Regardless of what they are. Christians, not Christians, or whatever. Those who are sanctified means that they have cleansed their spiritual eyes. So not only do they experience God, okay, and they can experience Him, but they can also see the presence of God with their spiritual eyes. Yeah. That's why I said it's not where they are. It's what they can see. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, Panayoti. <laughs> a, a, a place to find the canons of the church. Um, yes, there's a book which is called the Rada Topidalion. Um, taxi. I wouldn't recommend a lay person to be studying the Pidalion. Why? Because, um, because it's very deep. It has a lot of rules and regulations in it. And each is... Uh, but also, the, there's, the church uses them according to... Um, how can I say? Using its discretion... And a lot of people have taken the Pidalion, the Rada, and said, but this canon says this, and this canon says that. Okay, you know, but uh, sometimes it's taken out of context. So the Pidalion is, 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 is a book which is used or should be used mostly by those who are spiritual fathers and the bishops of the church. Yeah, because I've, I've seen lay people take it and use it and abuse it. Yeah. Yeah. And they are not the dogmas of the church. The canons are not the dogmas of the church. The dogmas of the church are one thing and the canons of the church are another thing. Yeah. The dogmas of the church, you easily read the creed. <laughs> it's the easiest way. It's got everything there. They're the dogmas of the church, which are unchangeable. Um, you're going to say something? Mm -hmm. With everything that's happening. Mm. 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 And, and, and this is why, and I guess this is why God, you know, when He says that He's come not to judge or condemn the world, but to save the world, I believe God in all His wisdom. Um, does everything that he can to save absolutely everyone. That's not to say that everyone will be saved. And the, the unfortunate reality is, is that, that some people, some people just have that, that ego, that, they, that whatever, whatever comes in front of them, you know, they don't. But for someone who doesn't know God, um, again, for someone who doesn't know God, but yet might know, but might have a little bit of that humility in their heart. God will find ways to save them, and that could be through a sickness. That could be something as simple as that person being charitable, you know, and being you know sacrificial in that way. And I know a lot of people that are not Christians and not even believers, and yet are, are, are like that. 
So, yeah, and, and, and don't think that God overlooks all of that just because, you know, they're not Christian. And there's a lot of reasons why people might not be Christian. And sometimes, sometimes it's because they've seen Christians and that's why they don't want to be Christian. <laughs> Mm. Mm. And these are these are all godlike qualities. You can't deny that. They're gifts. They're God given gifts. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Oh dear. Yes, young lady. That it's God yeah. in that sense yes absolutely absolutely you know and sometimes they you find very humble people like that and and I think that you said the right you used the right word pharisaic before like we become like Pharisees sometimes because yes part of being the church is also responsibility and when you when you're actively part of the church um, and you, you believe in your heart that, you know, the church is the truth, okay, the true way, sometimes that can get to your head a little bit, you know, and we start to believe that we're something. But true humility, and this is how you know that you're humble, to know that you're humble is never to believe that you're humble. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I, I, I say to people, be careful, be careful, there's some pride there, you've got, you've got a bit of ego. I don't have ego, Father. <laughs> well, just that reaction showed me that you've got ego. <laughs> what are you? Anything else? Let's pray. O Christ, the true light, which, who enlightens and sanctifies every human coming into this world, may the light of your countenance shine on us, so that in it we may see the unapproachable light and guide our paths to the work of your commandments. By the intercessions of your all spotless mother and all your saints, through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Have a beautiful evening. See you next week.